بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We move on to a chapter of this book عمدة الأحكام that deals with the changing of the Salat from Bayt al-Maqdis to the Kaaba, which also leads us to one of the conditions of prayer, which is the ruling on facing the Kaaba, the Qibla, when praying. As we know that this is a condition. So is it a condition at all times, or there are times that we are permitted to let go of this condition? This is, inshallah, what we will learn in Hadith number 67. And who will give us the honor of reading it? Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, used to pray atop his camel, no matter what direction it was facing, gesturing to represent the moments of the prayer. And Ibn Umar used to do that. In another narration, he used to offer vitr on his camel, and in a narration for Muslim, except that he wouldn't pray the mandatory prayers. Al-Bukhari also said, except for the Faraid, mandatory prayer. This hadith is referring to a situation when the Prophet ﷺ used to travel. So no one would come and say that he was moving in his Medina, in the city, and praying to the other direction of Qibla. What do we learn from this? One, that it is permissible for a person traveling and riding to pray voluntary prayers even if he was not facing the Qibla. But can he do this with mandatory prayers? The answer is no. Because the Prophet ﷺ as in the hadith, clearly indicating that he would not do that with mandatory prayers. Now we're talking about when you have a choice. So if I'm riding, if I'm driving, I'm going to somewhere, I may perform as many voluntary prayers as I wish. But when it comes to mandatory prayers, I have to take the side of the road and pray my mandatory prayer facing the Qibla, standing up in the normal conditions. Why? Because this is what the Prophet used to do. So let us also look at this hadith we have in our hands. On the camel, how would the Prophet bow or prostrate? It states in the hadith that he used to gesture. He used to nod. And that is why scholars say, when you are praying sitting down, when you make your bow, you do this, and when you prostrate, you go a little bit further. So it would not be the same. There would be a difference. And prostrating would be more down. The incline would be more down. So this is regarding voluntary prayers. So you have to have these conditions. You have to be traveling. It has to be voluntary. And you have to be riding. The most authentic opinion is even if a person is traveling on foot in other than the direction of Qibla, he is given the permission because he's traveling to pray voluntary prayers and he nods and he leans a little bit more for his bowing and for his prostration. Now we go back to the issue of mandatory prayers. Mandatory prayers, when you are in control, when you're able to stop the car, then you have to stop it. But nowadays, a lot of us travel in airplanes. It would be a little bit difficult if you go to the captain and say, stop now, I want to pray. Because then he would either have to throw you or he would have to land and none of the two choices are acceptable. So in this case, if you're in a bus, if you're in a train, if you are on a plane, the scholars say, you have to try 
and fulfill as many conditions and as many pillars as possible. So first of all, the plane is traveling in a direction. Can you face the direction of the Qibla? He says, yes I can. Then it's a must. If he says, no, there is no way I can face the direction of the Qibla. Then why? He says, because I have to face the other direction and there's no place for me to stand. Can't you go next to the wing or at the back of the airplane to pray? Sheikh, if I stand next to the wing, they'll say that I'm trying to open the emergency exit and hijack the airplane. I can't do that. So in this case, we say, okay, the direction of the Qibla facing it, you are excused because you are unable to do this. A lot of the people, when we tell them this, they say, Alhamdulillah, khalas, we pray on our seats, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Muhammad, and so on. Is this acceptable? Yes or no? For those who said yes, raise your hands. One, five, ten, seven. Okay. Those who say no, raise your hands. Okay. Give the microphone to the brother, please. Yes. The one in the second row. Why isn't it acceptable? It's okay. If you don't know, just say, I feel it's not acceptable, but I don't know why. I can't tell the exact reason, I mean. But you feel that it is unacceptable? Yes. Who shares the opinion that it's not acceptable? Okay, give the microphone to the brother there. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. According to what I feel, it's not acceptable because the first thing of the namaz is the qibla. So we aren't able, but standing is also compulsory. Very good, excellent. This is the right answer. Standing up in prayer is what? A pillar. It's a pillar facing the Qibla is condition. And the conditions that cannot be fulfilled, they fall. But a pillar, now you say, I can't face the Qibla. I say, okay, stand up. He said, where to stand up? In your seat. When you're sitting, can't you stand next to your seat in front of it? He said, yes, but people will look at me. Ah, now you're ashamed of people looking at you. This is not a good excuse. Standing up is a pillar in mandatory prayers. So if you decide to pray sitting down, your prayer is invalid. The Prophet said, Salli qa'iman. He instructed his companion, pray standing up. If you're unable, pray sitting down. If you're unable, pray lying on your side. So you are able to stand. There you have to stand. Now, you may be able to bow, but you're definitely unable to prostrate. So you must bow. If you can, prostrating, sit down on your seat and prostrate. And then continue your prayer as usual. So this is essential because I travel a lot and I see Muslims praying in a wrong way that Allah Azza wa will not accept. Now, going back to the hadith at hand, people may ask, if I am a taxi driver, and I travel in my city for eight hours, doing approximately 500 kilometers, 400 kilometers. So can I offer my salat, voluntary prayer in the car? Now, when you do this, I'm not sure if it's a yes or a no. So you have to be any specific when you move your head, please. So is it yes or a no? Those who say yes, please raise your hands. Is his prayer as a taxi driver, voluntary prayer, in the car, accepted or not? One, two, three. Those who say no, raise your hands. And those who say no are more, but the majority do not elaborate, do not know. I stated in the beginning that the conditions for your voluntary prayer to be accepted would be to be riding, to be traveling. And the person driving in the city is not traveling, he's in his home. And to be offering voluntary prayer. Therefore, a taxi driver, a bus driver, a train driver, working in his vicinity, in his town, he cannot offer any prayer on his car, or on his train, or on his vehicle. Understood? Now, if 
a person is traveling from one city to the other and the Qibla is behind him or on his side and he wants to start a voluntary prayer is it must that he faces the Qibla in the beginning and says Allahu Akbar and then go wherever his car takes him or it is not a must it's an issue of dispute the scholars say that there are hadiths that the Prophet used to do this and the majority say that you must but the most authentic opinion is that you do not have to do this in voluntary prayers so even if the Qibla is in behind you or onto your side you're not obliged to face it and give the first takbira and then move on in any direction you're not obliged but it is definitely something that would add value to you and it is something that is recommended we have a short break stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back assalamu alaikum and welcome back is night prayer included in voluntary prayer is night prayer included yes and that is why the hadith clearly states that he used to offer witr on his camel and it's very sad that this is a sunnah that a lot of the Muslims don't do I travel and sometimes I travel at night and I don't watch or see anyone who is offering witr or is offering night prayer on his seat to wherever the plane is taking him not only that I've traveled and so many times on airplanes that the majority of the passengers are Muslims we see the break of dawn we see the daylight we see the sunrise and only one or two pray Fajr and the rest are either asleep or just looking around not knowing what to do why is that a lot of the Muslims think that as long as they're traveling they have the permission to delay prayers or to pray them when they reach and arrive and this is completely wrong if the prayer can be joined to something similar to it like Asr and Dhuhr or Isha and Maghrib this is permissible to pray and join and combine but if it's something like Fajr if it's something like Isha khalas, time of Maghrib is over and Isha is about to finish you have to pray it no matter what happens we have hadith 68 but before we go to the hadith do we have any questions so we have enough questions inshallah yes brother Sheikh, uh, since this is a hadith on traveling what is the distance from which the shortening of the prayer starts that's a good question what is the distance that we would consider to be permissible for us to shorten prayer and to break our fast if we're fasting because we are taking the ruling of a traveler it's an issue of dispute among scholars but the most authentic opinion and this is the choice of Sheikh Islam bin Taymiyyah, Sheikh Nasir, Din al-Albani, Sheikh bin Uthaymeen may Allah have mercy on their soul they all said that there is not a prescribed distance meaning the description that fits you as a traveler is sufficient so if you travel and people call your house and your family say well he's not here he's traveling then this is sufficient even if it's a hundred kilometers or a 50 kilometer it's from one city to the other then this is considered to be traveling and that is why scholars say that if I'm traveling to another city the minute I leave the borders of my city I immediately take the ruling of a traveler I shorten prayers I combine even if I am about a kilometer out of the border one kilometer because I am on my journey I've started the destination is regardless it's not of importance the most important thing that it is considered to be a traveling destination to my city so if I'm in Bombay for example if I tell someone I'm leaving to Delhi everybody will say that he is traveling if I'm in Jeddah Saudi Arabia and I say I'm going to Riyadh everybody says this is traveling but if the two cities are so close to the extent that the population consider it to be a one city not traveling then you may not take the excuse of traveling for example Jeddah people when they go to Mecca they do not shorten prayer although it's about 85 kilometers why because we work in Mecca 
and we may go to Mecca twice a day, and we do not consider it to be traveling. We consider Jeddah to be part of the suburbs of Mecca. So the people of Jeddah don't travel to Mecca. What is the meaning of establish prayer? So you're asking about what is the meaning of establishing prayer, or in Arabic, wa aqimu salat. To establish prayer is to call for it, to prepare for it, and to gather for it, and to pray it on time as prescribed. So it's not pray. You have to establish the prayer because it's a constitution. It is composed of performing ablution, praying it on time, and in the location that were prescribed to us by the Prophet which are the masjids. And not only that, if someone prays without a soul, he's just doing these actions without having the soul of the prayer, the khushur, the submissiveness, the contemplation, the concentration, then he would not be considered to have established prayer. You have to have all of this, and it's not an easy thing to do. Yes, uh, Muhammad Aman. Regarding traveling, uh, as you said that if we don't know the Qibla, we can, we can be exempted we, if we don't face the Qibla, while maybe in a plane. But usually in a train what happens, for example, uh, if we can face the Qibla, but we cannot Maintain. do the Qiyam. We cannot do the Qiyam in the direction of the Qibla. But on the other hand, we can do the Qiyam and proper sujood, but not facing the Qibla. So which one to choose? Because we have, you know, sleeper class. We can sit and we can even prostrate towards the Qibla. But on the other hand, we can stand and do sujood, but it's not in the direction of the Qibla. So which one to choose? Whenever there is a contradiction between a condition and a pillar, the pillar always comes first. So if you have the ability to face the Qibla, but unable to stand, yet in a different location you can stand, but you may not face the Qibla, the pillar of the prayer which is connected to the prayer is far superior than the conditions that come. Faisal. If a person, he leaves from his hometown for a journey, now he is considered to be traveling. And if he reaches his destination, I have seen many people that they still consider it to be as traveling. They say that we are on suffer. The question is obvious. If I am going back to my home city, as long as I did not reach the borders of my home city, I am considered to be traveling. So I can do everything a traveler does. Once I reach the borders of my city, I'm not a traveler anymore. So I have to pray the prayers complete, not shortened. Yet the combining depends. If I am reaching my city after Isha, and I did not pray Maghrib because I was traveling, I will do combining of Maghrib to Isha, but I will pray Isha full as four rak'ahs. However, another scenario is I'm going to my hometown, on the way, Maghrib is called, and I know that after half an hour, I will reach my hometown. So I decided to pray Maghrib and combine Isha, two rak'ahs to it. Is this permissible? Yes, it is permissible. I would reach my hometown before the Adhan of Isha. The Adhan of Isha is called, I'm not supposed to go and pray because I prayed, Alhamdulillah, and this does the job, inshallah. Sheikh, as you said that for Qasr, we have to have some sharait. Sir, you have to be a traveler. But for jama'ah, do we have any reason? The conditions for joining prayer is the necessity. For a traveler, he can join prayers whenever he wishes, though it is recommended that he prays on time. For a residing person, there is a permission to join prayers when in necessity. So a, a, a doctor, a surgeon is going to do an operation he is going to operate after Dhuhr. But he knows that he would not finish except after Maghrib. So when he prays Dhuhr four rak'ahs, he adds to it four rak'ahs of Asr. This is permissible. A person undergoes an exam that comes once a year. And there is no possibility of him coming out. So he, they tell him, you have to stay. He cannot pray Maghrib and Isha. So we tell him it's okay because it's an emergency, it's a once a year, you pray Maghrib with Isha at the time of Isha, but you pray them complete. Likewise, in cases of rain, in cases of snow, you join Dhuhr and Asr, you also join Maghrib and Isha. Yes, brother. Sheikh, like we are living in a non-Muslim country, 
and there is a possibility that they there may come a rule that we may not order we may not you know offer salah in our in our masjids like in france there there is in france there is likely a possibility that may they may you know cancel the salah in masjid if people offer salah in their home so what do you say that like salah is established or not if there were to be a hypothetical law preventing you from establishing prayer and praying with the congregation and i very rarely think that this is possible anywhere in the world but if hypothetical this were to happen you have to migrate because one of the conditions of living in a non muslim country is that you are able to establish your deen you're able to establish your prayer you are able to establish eating halal food your wife is able to maintain her hijab and you are able to practice deen without any pressure or harassment so if you were to be banned from praying in the masjid what else what deen remains for you you have to migrate and leave the country uh the brother assalamu alaikum this is like regarding traveling in the train suppose i offer a salah like standing in the train and if the train is moving chances are there i can topple and i can hurt myself or a person down below so is it like there is any scope to sit and pray or should i skip the prayer or should i like continue skipping the prayer is out of the question completely you have to pray on time the alternative would be if there is probable cause of fear yani it's not something that it is a possibility no you know by the train or by if you're on sailing on a boat in a storm and you insist on praying on the deck and you know that you may fall and drown or on a train that you may fall and hurt someone or hurt yourself in this condition these are condition of fear you may pray sitting down without any problem inshallah yes the last brother there on the corner sheikh for how many days uh, can a traveler shorten his salah that's a good question how many days does a traveler is permitted to shorten prayer and to take all the excuses and the rukhas of traveling scholars differ some say that if he intends to stay for more than 4 nights and 4 days he must complete others say 11 others say 19 and the most authentic opinion is there is no limit at all as long as you're traveling you're considered to be traveling you may shorten prayer but the minute you reside so if someone like me if i go abroad for a week or two or three or four i'm considered to be a traveler the minute i decide to reside and i get myself an apartment and furnish it and i know the times of prayers and i know how to travel and communicate i have to complete but as long as i'm still traveling and i'm unsettled i'm not settled then I should deal with these things as a traveler. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fi amanillah wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.